Mr. President, it's a very great honor to be invited back to speak at the Oxford Union, which the Union has not done for 30 years. Um, I first came here 65 years ago and spoke, but for the last 30 years I haven't been invited. And that might have something to do with the fact that uh, I am in the Guinness Book of Records for having made the longest speech in Parliament for 100 years. <laughs> in fact, while I was making that speech, one of my colleagues went out to speak to constituents and they said, what's he speaking about? And my colleague said, about four and a half hours. <laughs> and they said, but no, no, what is his subject? And my colleague said, he hasn't said. Uh, that evening, I was speaking in my constituency of Burton-on-Trent, and normally, the Toastmaster says, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for your Member of Parliament. On this occasion, the Toastmaster said, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, pray for the silence of your Member of Parliament. <laughs> so, I'm so delighted to be here and to be back. Uh, it's very nice to be in the presence of such excellent speakers. I'm not being patronizing. I couldn't follow all of their arguments because they were very quick and they were very thorough and they were very deep. So I hope you'll forgive me if I don't spend the next eight minutes commenting on all that they had to say. But um, I think our position here is a lot can be said in favor of legalization. But whatever can be said in favor of legalization doesn't begin to match the harm that more drug addiction does to society. You heard Abigail talking just now about the mental effects. Drug taking is horrifying. I don't think any of the speakers has argued that drug taking is not important, is not horrible, is not something that's got to be stopped. Everybody agrees that the harm done, whether it's violence done by drug addicts, whether it's criminality in order to fund drug addiction, whether it's attitudes towards children in a family, whether it's domestic abuse, whatever is done by drug addicts is harmful, isn't it? And I don't think anything anybody has said on either side so far this evening can dispute that. And if drug taking is so harmful, then how can it be a good thing, whichever way you look at it, whichever way you look at legalization and whether you define it one way or the other, it doesn't matter. We know what legalization is. We know what regulation is. The fact of the matter is it's going to do more harm to society. It may not be a great, may, may, may I, continue my argument a, a little longer because I only have five minutes now and uh, it goes very quickly. Forgive me. Uh, um, perhaps we can talk about it afterwards. The, the, there can't be any argument that drug taking at any level is harmful. And there can't really be any argument, can there, that if you extend drug taking to people who now don't take it because they are frightened of the law or frightened of their parents or whatever reason is that they don't take drugs and a lot of people don't take drugs, then to encourage them to take it uh, by making it legal. You see, I've spent 60 years, as you've heard, at the criminal bar. Drug taking has been the worst of the crimes until very recently when economic crime is worse. 
it's been an appalling part of my income, a massive part of my income, because people on drugs commit crimes. People on drugs commit violence. People on drugs get worse and worse. And you can't spend your life dealing in crimes of that kind and not say, no, no, we must not extend it. We must restrict it. And there is some evidence that the laws have reduced heroin and cocaine consumption. Not a great deal, but there is some. And that's quite optimistic. We've been asked to talk about, well, just personal use. That is, a very small amount of extra drug being allowed to happen perfectly legally. But in my 60 years at the criminal bar, there hasn't been a heroin addict or a cocaine addict or a terrible drug addict of any kind whatsoever who did not start with cannabis. And you can see how the drug dealers work and how they would work if this was legalized. You've just had a little cannabis. Didn't it give you a buzz? Why not try this? It'll give you more of a buzz. So the criminality grows. If anybody tries to pretend that uh, making something un uh, perfectly legal uh, will reduce the crime, it's total nonsense. It's not illegal to have cigarettes, but all the big crime in the world centers around cigarette abuse, trafficking of cigarettes, trafficking of alcohol. It all happens even though it's perfectly legal to have cigarettes and to have alcohol. And again, much of my income has come over the years from dealing with the offenses that are caused by perfectly legal cigarettes and alcohol. Fraud. Uh, we had to invent VAT, didn't we? To raise some money. Value added tax on everything and including legal cigarettes and legal alcohol. And what effect does that have? The VAT frauds are massive. So don't be fooled into thinking, I'm sure you wouldn't be because you're an intelligent audience, don't be fooled into thinking that somehow if something is made perfectly legal, it will reduce the amount of crime, the amount of criminals, the amount of harm that's done. It's total nonsense. It's all very well for Rosalie who is delightful and charming and very, very engaging, to say that evidence and facts are all that matters. But she went on to say that no country has ever showed a relationship between legalization and increased use. Where'd she get that from? That's no fact. That's no evidence. You'd have to be a raving lunatic, wouldn't you, to think that if you made more drugs available, it wouldn't have an effect? But that's the kind of argument we've been hearing today. So, to sum up, because I've heard the bell, not because I want to sum up, I'd like to go on for four and a half hours to try to persuade you. But to sum up, we say, yes, yes, of course, some good would come from legalizing, but it doesn't begin to compare with the harm that will be done as children get told that it's all right to smoke cannabis um, and uh, then they do it for the first time and then it goes on to bigger 
and worse things and bigger and worse crimes and more hateful things happening in our society. But, Mr. President, I must say, Mr. President, to, to just to, for a moment, um, when there is a lovely fable about um, a leprechaun who, when you're born, if he kisses your feet, you become a great footballer. Uh, if he kisses your fingers, you become a great pianist. If he kisses your throat, you become a great singer or a great speaker. Uh, I don't know, Mr. President, uh, where the leprechaun kissed you, but I must say you're a very excellent chairman. And can I just add this, and I heard that bell. I can't remember how many times I've spoken here. Actually, less times than I've spoken in the Cambridge Union, I think, over the many years. But I did, uh, I don't want to ask you to be my friend. I had a friend called Lalitha Lathalathmoodley, who was the president of this union, and he was assassinated. I had a friend called Lakshman Katagama, who was the president of this great union, and he was assassinated. I had a friend called Benazir Bhutto, uh, who was a president of this great union, and she was assassinated. So, you wouldn't want me to be your friend, <laughs> would you? That doesn't mean that I don't enjoy your company. It doesn't mean that I'm not grateful for the hospitality you've given. It doesn't mean that I am critical in any way of the wonderful speakers who you've chosen to host and to inform us and to teach us and me about the problem of drugs. But the fact of the matter is, however convincing our arguments may be, and I think they're very convincing and been beautifully portrayed. The fact of the matter is that people believe what they want to believe, don't they? Um, the government just believed that if you slash taxes without being able to give any explanation as to where the money comes from, it will be a great benefit to society. Uh, they believe that, they'll believe anything. Uh, Boris Johnson, a great president of this uh, union. 43% uh, of the conservatives think he ought to come back into power, even though he messed up very badly. <laughs> They'll believe anything. When I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I went to Moscow on one occasion, and we had uh, a dinner somewhere outside while having rest, and uh, Mick Mikado, the big uh, socialist, uh, told us about the greatness of socialism under Labour, and, uh, and uh, can I just have a moment longer? Uh, <laughs> I think you, you make an exception for jokes, don't you? Uh, and Peter Thomas, the Conservative, was making a speech and uh, talking about the greatness of the Conservatives under Thatcher. And then there was a, on the table from our Russian minder, a, um, uh, a KGB agent called Sasha. And he said, I won't tell a joke. I won't tell a joke. And I said, well, you can't tell a joke. You're a Russian. You have no sense of humor. He said, I insist on tell a joke. So this is the joke he told. And it's one of the funniest jokes I've ever heard. An Englishman, a Frenchman, and a Russian were all um, sitting, saying goodbye to us in the morning. And the Englishman said, and as I wave goodbye to my wife, uh, through the kitchen window, I see as she sits astride her horse, her feet touch the ground. This is not because in England our horses are stunted of growth, oh no. It is because in England our women have beautiful long legs. And the Frenchman said, and when I say goodbye to my wife in the morning, I embrace her, and my hands encircle her waist. This is not because in France we Frenchmen have very big hands. No, no. It is because in France, in France, he said, our oh, women have beautiful slim waist. And the Russian said, and when I say goodbye to my wife in the morning, I slap her on the behind. <laughs> and if when I get back from work, it is still wobbling, this is not because in Russia we 
our women have very big behinds. It is because in Russia, we have the shortest working day. <laughs> so people will believe what they want to believe. I only hope that when it comes to voting on this particular motion, you will use your sense, your experience, your knowledge to vote for this side of the House. And can I just say, finally, that um, um, I've spoken for 60 years to juries. I've spoken for 60 years to political audiences. And this is the first time I've spoken to a live audience. Thank you very much.